God bless you all this morning and thank God for everybody being here. What a great day in the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 8. It's where we got down to last week. The Lord has blessed us so greatly to have the Word of God and to be able to hear it, have somebody stand up here and read it to us. And God called men to teach and preach us the Word of God. It's a wonderful blessing. And I'm just glad to be here this morning, glad to do something for the Lord. Uh, I'm nothing without Him. And just pray that His Spirit would rule and reign in this, this time we have together this morning because he, he needs to go out. He needs to move amongst the hearts of the people because if He doesn't teach you His Word, nobody can do it. You know, and like I told you last, uh, I believe it was Wednesday maybe we was here and had a conversation with a guy at work. And said, hey, if the Word of God can't move you, you can't be moved. It's just the way it is. Amen. If this book as a Christian cannot get you in line, you cannot be gotten in line. Because this is the standard, the rule of all faith and practice for the Christian life. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 8. The Bible says, Who shall also confirm you unto the end. Praise God for that. That ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask you this morning to lead us and guide us in thy truth. And Father, we recognize that we're nothing this morning. We can't do anything without the Spirit of God, without the touch of the Lord on our life. And this, this moment and this time that we're in, pray that you'd touch each and every heart that's here this morning. Lord, take your word and, and plant it within the souls and spirits of thy children this morning. Help us to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. Give us wisdom and understanding through the light of your holy word. And help us walk upright to eschew evil in this generation. As you told, as Paul told Titus, Lord, that the grace of God hath appeared unto all men, teaching us. Lord, teach us this morning. We need your help. We need your guidance. And we pray that all things will be done to your honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Now here, we've been going through 1 Corinthians, this first part, the salutation that Paul has to these people at the Corinthian church, telling them who they are in God, that they're saved, they're born again, they're part of the body of Christ, they're called to be saints, told them over there that they, have, they were enriched in everything by God, which is an awesome blessing because we know we have everything we need to serve the Lord, all of it. The minute you get saved, God has equipped you for your battle. For the rest of your life here on this earth. Everything you have. Now we get to grow. Our faith can grow. We can add to these things. As Peter tells us. You know add to these things. Add to faith virtue and virtue. These things. There's things that we can add on. But all of it is going to come through the, the spirit of God. That abides in the bosom of every born again child of God. And here he's trying to tell them. Look in the end God is going to accomplish his work. The Bible says that he, he is able to finish the work that he has started in us. And he's going to himself confirm us on that day. The day of the Lord Jesus Christ or the judgment seat of Christ for the child of God. Where everything that we have done as a child of God will be brought into judgment. And that ought to give us some pause this morning. To think about how we live. What we do for God. Because... We're going to give an account for it, Brother David. That's right, brother. The Bible says that we all shall stand. We're going to be there before God. I'm not going to be able, Brother David's not going to be able to call me over to try to help him justify something for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to be me and God. It's going to be him and God, you and God this morning is how it's going to be. And our stewardship will be brought to light. How we've built on the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says you can build gold, silver, precious stones, or you can build wood, hay, and stubble. All of it's going to be tried by fire. And fire, specifically in the Bible, speaks of judgment. The fire of God, it's the judgment. The Bible said He is a consuming fire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but He will be able to confirm us because when He saved us, like we have taught and it's been preached here, and it's, you have read, no doubt, in the Word of God, when you get saved, you're sealed by the Holy Ghost of God. You're kept by the power of God. And God is going to take us from the moment of salvation all the way through this life. He's going to come back and get us Himself. 
He's going to take us to this judgment himself. He will make us arrive there on time. We'll be there. And he will make us show up and he will judge us there. And it's not a judgment to see if we're saved or lost. This is only a judgment for the Christian. For the born again child of God, the person who's, sta who's saved and born again will appear at this judgment. And the Bible speaks of two judgments. The one for the Christian, which is what we're talking about here, the judgment seat of Christ, and then the great white throne judgment that's mentioned in Revelation for all of the dead, the, those that are lost and undone without God. And they will be judged according to their works. Now notice this. If God's going to confirm us to the end and make us to where we're blameless, how is that possible considering all the things that we do wrong, Dale? <laughs> Do we not mess things up all the time? Even as a child of God, we're still prone to fall. And that's a, a primary teaching of the New Testament that the Christian has a dual nature. He has the flesh. He has the spirit. They're lusting one against the other. They're, they're contrary to one another. Every day for the Christian is, on, is a battlefield. You're on the battlefield every day. Like that old song says, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Hey, you're either going to fall in that battle or you're going to rise. Yes. And every day is a new one. You have an opportunity to get up and start your day with the Lord. Amen. Crucify the flesh. Yes. Mortify the deeds of it. I mean, these terms are New Testament terms yes. that we are to apply. And like we had said last week, He should enrich our utterances, our speech, and our knowledge, the way we think, the way we do things. And I was thinking about this this morning. It's like I can remember a lot of conversations with like Aunt Elsie and Uncle Dale, if I was around them or if I was around my dad, around my pa, always somebody was mentioning God. Mentioning the Word of God. I mean, that's a blessing to me. That ought to be, because that shows you that your speech is seasoned with the salt and light of this Word. And any conversation that you have in this world, you can bring God into it. You know why? Because in the beginning, God. He's the originator of all things. That's His creation we're looking at. You want to talk to somebody, oh, look how, how pretty it is out there. Yeah, God made that. I mean, it's anything you can take back to this book. And there's an opportunity for us to, to, to hasten back to the cross of Calvary to tell about all that Jesus has done for us. Because that right here is the beginning of our spiritual life, of our blessings, of our hope. All the things that we have is invested in what He did on Calvary. The death, the burial, the resurrection of God's Son. And here it tells us that He's going to confirm us and, and we're going to be blameless. And we studied this over in, in Romans. I'm just going to read to you. I have to turn over here, but I'm going to read you this. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says, We know that all things work together to the good. To them that love God and to them who are the called according to His purpose. Now notice verse 29, it says, For whom He did foreknow, He did also predestinate to, become, to be conformed to the image of His Son. That's the end goal of every child of God. When God saves us, He's going to make us like His Son. And He says that He might be the firstborn among many brethren, whom, whom over, moreover, whom He did predestinate, He also called. And whom He called, He also justified. Which means He's made us as we have never sinned. That's why in 1 John chapter 5, we can read that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. The flesh ain't born of God. The, the inner man is born again. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that the, this body right here ain't going to appear at the judgment seat of Christ? Mm -hmm. It's going to be left behind. That's right. Because in Genesis chapter 3, God condemned the flesh. Yeah. It's going back to the dust of the earth, Brother Gary. Mm -hmm. Hey, I can say praise God on that. I don't want to take it with me. I don't want it now. <laughs> yeah, it gives me problems every day of my life. And I'm not talking about physically, just physically. I'm talking about spiritually speaking. Yeah. It's fighting against me. And I, and, and I can't even imagine that burden being lifted for me, Josh. To when I open my eyes in glory to have that no more. Glory to God. That's going to be awesome. Yes, it is. But while we're here, we need to recognize that we're in a battle. And unfortunately, it's sad that a lot of people just don't want to admit that. They don't want to grasp that fact. That, hey, your flesh, if you don't do something with it, will consume you. That's right. It will consume you. And you will be constantly walking in the flesh. 
There's people in the Bible that did it. People that were Christians that were saved and born again that did it. Lot did it. He was. Uh, I, there was a. There's a crossroad sometimes in a Christian's life where God is like, "Look, you need to make a choice. Are you going to follow me? Or are you going to go your own way?" And, and that choice for Lot came that day when there was a, a a big falling out with him and Abraham over their herds. The herdsmen of Lot and the herdsmen of Abraham were fussing and fighting. And Abraham come to him and offered him a choice. Abraham, whose mind and his utterances were seasoned by this book at that time, by the words of God, he said, if you go to the right, I'll go to the left. And he didn't stop there. But he said, but if you go to the left, I'll go to the right. Lot, what he did was he looked yeah. he looked and saw things he was walking by sight dale he wasn't walking by faith amen that's right he was not walking by faith he was looking what looked good to him mm -hmm. well he said this looks like this is a way better place than over here yeah. look at that dry dusty place over there it doesn't matter if it's if it's a garden of eden and the Sahara Desert. If God's over here, it's better. That's where he better go. <laughs> but he looked down there, the well-watered plains, and he 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 said over there. Next thing you know, the Bible said he pitched his tent toward Sodom. He made a a conscious choice to go down there with them sinners, mm -hmm. wicked and exceeding sinners. The Bible says. Yeah. And the next thing he know, the next thing we know, we, we read down there, years go by, and he is sitting in the gate. Which means he had a position of authority in that city. Hey, doing good. As far as the world is concerned, doing good. Got him a good job. A man of prominence in the city. But far from God. He had no testimony, son. Zero. You study that out for yourself. When them angels came down there, they told Lot, he knew who they were when he saw them. When God comes on the scene when you're doing wrong, you know who he is. When God sends a messenger to you to tell you about this, you know who they are. You know, you can recognize right away that's from God. And he wanted to try to take care of them. Well, and he told uh, them angels told him, said, get all your family. Tell them we're leaving. He went to try to tell them, and they didn't believe anything he said. He told his sons-in-law, and they said, who are you to tell us? He said, it's, they seemed unto him as one that mocked, like he was joking. But see, his testimony was gone. Ruined. Zero. Had no influence with him. None. They died in the, in, the, in the fire and brimstone of that city. They, they were there. They were consumed with the rest of them wicked people. Lot had an opportunity to try to win them to the Lord. Didn't do it. He never should have been there. What, his whole life was a waste. Period. All of it. Even his memory was a thorn in the side of Israel because of the Ammonites and the Moabites. Every time somebody mentioned Ammonites and Moabites, well, you can go, where did they come from? Lot. God help us. We can be a curse on our brothers and sisters through our, 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 our absolute disobedience to His Word. And, and it's astounding to me, like I say, every time I get up here, to how David just spit something out that I was studying. Like Dad was preaching in James. And I love the book of James. Yes. It's wonderful. And... The, my studies led me there too. But see, it's like, like I've said before, I have, this week I have read several scriptures that I have looked at many, many times and God has showed me something brand new. <laughs> Stuff that's right there in front of your face, but it wasn't the time for me to get that in my heart. And we've always said, have we not always said, be a, a doer, not only a hearer of the Word of God. <laughs> Such an important Scripture. But, 
I'm getting ahead of myself. John 5, 22, as he says he's going to confirm us, he said, the, he said, the Father judges no man, but hath committed all judgment to the Son. When we stand before God, it ain't gonna, these people, are, they don't, when they say what? Think ye of Christ. Whose Son is He? Like they said. These people don't want the Son of God. But they'll say that they're serving God. The Bible said, if you don't receive the Son, you cannot receive the Father. Why? Because God said it. He, is, he said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye Him. That's it. It's Him. It's, it's, it's a, the Son of God or death and hell. That's all there is to it. But he's the one that's going to be sitting on that great white throne. The Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to be sitting on the judgment seat of Christ. God the Father ain't going to be there. Sitting on there in judgment. The Bible tells us he's plainly. I'm not saying he's not going to be there. But what I'm saying. He's not the one who's judging. It's the son. He has given it to him. All judgment. That's what Jesus said in John 5.22. Him alone. Romans 8. And 33, he says, Who shall lay anything to the charge of the elect? It is God that justifies. It's God who can say you're sinless. I can't pronounce myself sinless, but my Father can. And then he says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Jesus Christ. So either whether somebody is going to be condemned, or whether they're going to be justified and confirmed, it'll be the Son of God who does it. And Paul's trying to tell him here, He's going to take you through to the end. Mm -hmm. But there are times when we stumble and fall and we need help. Oh, yeah. We need help. And, and eight, Romans 8, 26 said, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Because <laughs> we need some help from Him. But we see here in Matthew 10, 32, Jesus said, He that confesseth me before men, him will I confess before my Father. God is going to say our name and say we're cleared of all charges on that day. That's going to be glorious. And you know, like we've said in the last few weeks, that sowing and reaping is, a, is specifically tied to Christians. It is a spiritual thing. Either whether you reap to the flesh or to the spirit, you sow to the flesh or sow to the spirit, you're going to reap to either or. It's a Christian thing. It ain't to the lost. It's to Christians. And, and, and in Revelations 3, 5, it tells us that he's going to confess our name. And he said, "Who is he that overcometh to him will I give a white raiment. And, and he, will, he will be in heaven. God's going to put us there. But he said, he that overcometh. Well, you say, well, does that mean we got to keep, keep doing right or to get in? No, 1 John, 1 John over there in 5 First John chapter 5 verses 4 and 5 tells us that who is he that overcometh? It is even our faith. He that overcometh is, is him that believes on the Son of God. That's what's going to give us overcome. In the Son of God. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it tells us here, this is, this is a wonderful thing that we are to recognize is that the Lord is going to keep us. He's going he's to bring us to that time. And Paul's trying to tell them that. And he tells them over here in verse 9, God is faithful. That's why we're going to make it. Because God's faithful. He is the one. He's going to get us there. He, he called us unto the fellowship of His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verse 10, it said, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and this is 1 Corinthians 1, 10, that y'all speak the same thing. Golly. There can't be divisions among us, folks. We, we can't have division. If we're going to, if we're going to serve God, if this church is going to do anything for God, there cannot be division. I've heard of it my whole life. I know dad has been in church his whole life. And I know other people in here probably could tell you of, of many, many stories about divisions in the church over stupid, peddly nonsense that should not even be named among Christians. But he tells us you should speak the same thing and there should be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Psalm 133.1. Brother David just read that a while ago. 
How, how beautiful is it for the, the brethren to dwell in unity? Sure. Unity. There will be varying differences in here, but I'm talking about when it comes to receiving this book, we are to be on the same page. When, when, when God's word is spoken, we are to agree. Yeah, that's God's word. Exactly. Period. No ifs, ands, or buts, Brother Steve. God said it, and some guy said, well, God said it, and I believe it, and that settles it. No. God said it, that settles it. It don't matter if you believe it or not, or if I believe it or not, it's still settled. When God said it, that's the end of it. So in this one verse, he says, speak the same thing. No divisions, perfectly joined together, in the same mind and the same judgment. You know, the mind is what God gives us to even grasp and understand what is being said to us, but judgment is, uh, in this case, is our opinion of what we're hearing, how we receive that truth. And it's very important. And like we said before, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, there is one, one body, spirit, hope, Lord, faith, baptism, God, and Father of all. There's only one, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. We know that. And there's only one word. John 15, 26 tells us that the, when Jesus said, when the Comforter shall come, He will testify of me. No one, no one who is saved and born again can truthfully say that God leads them in a different direction than other Christians. Because that would be contrary to God's word. God has one Bible. And it's applicable to every single child of God across the board. End of story. There is no special group of pets that God has that He treats differently. It ain't like, oh, well, these men are preachers. These men are pastors. So they get different standards than the rest of us. No, we're all brethren. Brothers and sisters in Christ. We're all one. So there will never be anything contrary to the Word of God. Uh, Galatians 3.28 tells us that we're all, there's no bond, there's no free, there's no Jew, there's no Greek. All them things are done away with in Christ. All of them. It's all over with. But notice, problems arise amongst God's people. Either it be individuals, whether it be families, churches, nations, communities, whatever it may be. Problems arise when we refuse to do what God says. Amen. That's why I'm going to go to James and I'm going to read you some scriptures and I want you to pay attention this morning to what's being said. Notice in James chapter number 1 verse 19, we all know this scripture. Everybody sitting here has heard this. 19 says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, who's he talking to? The children of God. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. You've got to put some things aside this morning to even be able to hear the word of God. That's what, remember last week when I said a lot of times instead of, I was telling my children, hey, you need to work first, play later. And then it's always playing first and working later. And it seems to be the same thing in the Christian life. I'm going to do what I want to do first and then I'll do God's will. Exactly. It doesn't work like that. Absolutely not. It ain't going to work out like that. <laughs> That's why he says, and I said, you know, a lot of people... Do not pray during the week. They do, and, and especially even Saturday, they'll do. They'll they'll burn the midnight oil on Saturday, and just barely come shuffling into God's house, tired, wiping the sleep out of their eyes, can't concentrate because they're thinking about all kinds of other stuff. Not even preparing to hear God's word. I mean, I dare say a lot of Christians will not even pray. And ask God to help them in the service. And to, to be able to receive something from God. It's a shame. Preparation. Jesus over in the Old Testament. God told Moses. Hey. Tell them to get ready. 
Because in three days, I'm coming down there. Get ready because in six days, you'll be at the house of God. See, that, does that not make any sense? Should there not be a little bit of preparation before we come in God's house? But he says to put some things aside and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Now notice this. Here, here. We're going to read this together. We've all heard this. I know you've read it. You're like, yeah, I've heard that before. Yada, yada, yada. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. Now here's the part that really got me this week. And I, and I had to stop right here. I'm going to stop right here for just a moment. And I'm going to read you some scripture, just two scriptures, before we read the rest of this verse. 1 Peter 2, 6, the Bible says, Wherefore also it is contained in the scriptures, saith, uh, Behold, I lay and sign a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Yeah. Okay? If you're believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not going to be duped no. by the devil. No. No. All right? Now notice in Matthew 24, 24. Let me read you this quick verse. Matthew 24, 24 says, The disciple... Oops, that's the wrong verse. I'm over here in chapter 10. 24, 24. Yeah, see, I put my bookmark there and was in the wrong place. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, shall shew great signs and wonders, insomuch if it were possible. Which means it is impossible. Shall deceive the very elect. God's true born again children cannot be deceived. Cannot be confounded. But there is, there is no, there is no contradiction with what I'm about to read here. Remember the dual nature of the child of God. The old man and the new man. The inner man and the outer man. One saved, one lost. One fallen, one risen from the dead. He says, if, if you are a hearer only, Brother Gary, what happens you deceive yourself. You, how do people fall into sin? Because they do not do. They only hear. Is that not amazing? It is. That's how that we get into trouble. Because we just come and hear the Word of God. But we don't put the effort into doing the Word of God. You deceive yourself. That's what happens. And people are deceived to the point where they don't even understand that they're being used for the tool of the devil himself as a child of God. Amen. God have mercy. That's amazing to me. You wonder how people fall into things. How I wonder myself, how, do I, how did I get in this mess of doing something this stupid when I know better? Because I refused, even though I heard... And I knew the verse. I didn't do it. That's the problem. That's the problem. That's how simple that this whole thing really is. Hearing it, not doing it. And you can use any example in the world that you want to put in here for someone giving you some instruction and then when you don't do it, bad things happen. On the job, it doesn't. People can die by not following instructions. That's how important that it is. There's, there's saying you, you can lose your fingers, you can lose your arm, you can get your leg cut off, or you could die on your job by not following established procedure. People think within themselves, I don't need to do that. I know better. I've done this for 20 years. I don't need no instructions. But then they slip up and forget a step and tragedy happens. It happens every day. And every day for the Christian, there's people falling. There's people not doing the Word of God and bringing trouble on themselves. Exactly. Dad preached that message. 
on this very scripture, just a few verses up here in 13, don't blame it on God. I mean, is that not insane? Is that not absolutely insane for you to do something? I mean, I've heard it a million times. I've said it. As a child, I've said it. Well, if my brothers would have not did that, I wouldn't have did it. <laughs> How in the world does that justify what I did? <laughs> what did you say? If you're going to jump off the Empire State Bridge, are you going to do it? <laughs> no. <laughs> but you did that. Do what you want to. And Dad has told me that many times. I mean, you know, we've had many conversations. And, and, it, and it all boils <clears throat> down to this, Dale. It doesn't matter what you hear. How many times you're in the house of God, you're going to leave this, this church and you're going to do exactly what you want to do. <laughs> Period. That's it. Woo! But you got a choice of what you do with what you hear in this building. That's right, what you read in this book Thank you, Lord. carries weight. My words ain't got none. God's got it all. And if you don't do what God says, you will Suffer the consequence. God help us all. Exactly. To just simply do it. Do what it says. Just simply do it. That's what Paul's telling them here. God's going to confirm us to the end. But hey, you're still living in this world. Yeah. You're, there's still requirements. There are still regulations and rules for the child of God. God expects some things of us. When he did it all. It's our reasonable service is what the Bible said. God ain't asking you to do something that's crazy and out of the order. God, why would you ask me to do that? Why would you ask me to do that? You know I can't do that. You know I can't do it. Why would you ask me to do that? That's like somebody saying, hey, can I borrow $8,000? I'm like, why would you ask me that? I don't even have $1,000, much less $8,000. Why would you ask me that? And see, God asks us these things because He's already given it to us. That's right. He's already provided the means to do it. Exactly. We read over here that He has enriched us in all things. We're, we can do it. Yes. There is no debating with God and saying, I can't do it. Moses tried it. Didn't work. <laughs> no. Lots of people tried it. Jeremiah said, I'm not going to talk about it anymore. No he did. Yeah. This book is what's going to help us, folks. Instruction. And, and, and if, if you're planning on, and if I'm planning on just showing up to the house of God just to be a hearer, it's better just to not even come. Right. It's better to not hear it yeah. right, than to hear it and not do it. That's, right, That's all I'm saying this morning. But see, the sad thing is, even then you have no excuse. No. You know why? Because at one time God winked at ignorance. Yeah. He don't do it anymore. No reason to. We got the whole book. That's right. We got the whole God. God went through thousands of years for men to write this book. That over sixteen hundred years was the pending of this book, and we're we're two thousand years on the other side of that. So what in the world excuse do we got this morning? None. Zero. We're all guilty. All of us of not doing what God says all the time. That's right. There is nobody that's perfect. No. In, the, in, in this life, no, no. we all come short of the glory of God. But, the, but praise the Lord, we, the, the, the further we get on the road with God, the less we are to be able to fall. Amen. The less we are to do the stupid things that we do. Right. And then I'm not sitting up here pointing my fingers down at you. I'm talking about myself. Yeah, I don't know about your life. I know my life. And I can say with a, without a shadow of a doubt, I do stupid stuff. That's contrary to this book. God has to correct me. That's right. And I have to get my thinking lined up with this book. That's the whole point of teaching and preaching and instruction. Right. Is to tune us up to where we can fix the holes in the fence and move on to something else. Overcome it. Amen. Gain victory over it. Right. And move on for God. Go I hope you got a blessing this morning. Amen.